Do feelings of rejection and abandonment paralyze you or make you so desperate to hold on to your spouse that you don't recognize yourself anymore? Hi, I'm Kim Pullen and welcome to the Hope for Spouses Lunchtime Live. And today we are going to talk about those two very devastating topics, uh, abandonment and rejection and the feelings they cause in us. Now, if this is your first time coming to the Hope for Spouses Lunchtime Live, I want to welcome you. Uh, I started this ministry uh, about two years ago um, at in the middle of my, my husband's recovery. Uh, my husband had committed um, multiple uh, adulteries with various women and um, we separated for four years while I worked on myself and I let God work on him and we've been back together now we've just celebrated four years back together and we have an amazing relationship now we just embarked on a new adventure to North Carolina and um, we are very excited about where God is guiding us but I started this ministry because I realized there were a lot of women that were going through the same thing that I went through. And I, you know, there were, there were a lot of resources out there, but I felt like it was kind of like hit or miss and you didn't really know what worked for you. And, and there are some good Christian based programs out there, but I didn't really see ones that were like really hundred percent based on the Bible. And so that's how I really grew. That's how I transformed, how I really got healthy in the wake of my husband's uh, sin. And I let God deal with him. And I really wanted to create a safe place for spouses that are going through the same thing. And, and the majority of the people who come to Hope for Spouses are women, but we do have some men. I've actually had some calls from men who wanted to get some help because their wives were either serial adulterers or addicted to porn. And so uh, wherever you're at, welcome. And today we're going to talk about, like I said, those two devastating things, uh, rejection and abandonment. And these are really special to my heart in, in a sense that uh, this was a big fear of mine, uh, the fear of rejection and abandonment. I didn't have a great relationship with my dad when I was growing up. And it wasn't like my dad left, but he was he basically emotionally abandoned me and, and not because he was a mean person, but because he was not raised how to be intimate with other people. And so it kind of carries on back generation after generation. My grandfather didn't do it, you know, et cetera. And so my dad never learned how to really build an intimate relationship with me. And, I, and when I say intimate, I'm not talking about sex, of course, I'm talking about emotional intimacy. And we all need that to really build healthy relationships. So I grew up with a sense of abandonment and I didn't even know that's what it was, but there was a sense of abandonment from my childhood. Um, and so I was you know, scared as I got into adulthood and marriage to be rejected again. And like I said, I couldn't even put this into words at the time. I didn't know what it was. I just knew I felt this emptiness inside of me. And, um, and so this rejection, um, this fear of rejection of my spouse, once I realized that he was having all these affairs, um, my temptation initially was to do everything I could to keep him from leaving, to keep him from abandoning me, uh, because I felt like that was a commentary on who I was, that I wasn't good enough for him. And it wasn't until I really got connected to God that I began to understand that this was a whole different like this is a whole different way of looking at it, that God had a different way of looking at it. And so that's why I started Hope for Spouses. And that's why we are talking about this topic today and really realizing that those those feelings of rejection and abandonment are, are that, they're feelings. And sometimes feelings don't equal truth, okay? So there is a scripture I just, I wanna share with you just very briefly. In Jeremiah 17, nine, it says, the heart is deceitful, above all things and beyond cure, who can understand it? And the reason I share that is because I think sometimes these feelings of rejection, uh, especially the feeling of rejection, overwhelms us and it makes us obsess over things or it makes us see things in the wrong way. And we have to recognize that it is a feeling. And once we understand it is a feeling and that feelings don't always equal truth, that we can really embark on this and really find an answer to dealing with these feelings. Okay. So one of the things I wanted to talk about is, you know, how, how do we, how do we get that rejection from our spouse? Like, what do they say? What do they do? And some of these things may ring some bells for you or even unfortunately trigger you. 
but I want to start getting to the surface beneath this. What's what's let's really uncover this. So some of the things they may say to you are, um, you know, they play the blame game. OK, uh, it's your fault. I watch porn. Um, it's your fault. I look at other women. It's your fault. I have all these other relationships. You're not pretty enough. You're not sexy enough. You don't dress this way. You don't do this. You don't you know, have, you don't have enough sex with me or I mean, you name it. OK. Or they may say something as, well, I never really loved you or I don't love you anymore. But really what we interpret with all of that is that you're not good enough. You'll never be good enough for me. Now, I think it's really important that we know here that these are feelings that her husband is expressing and it doesn't equal truth. Again, the heart is deceitful. Okay. So these may, my, my spouse even said, I'm not sure I love you anymore. I and mean, we've been married for 19 years and that devastated me because this was, I mean, he was my, in a, in a very real sense as an adult, he was my first adult love. And so it devastated me to hear that coming from me, but it made me feel like I'm not good enough. I haven't done enough in order to earn his love, or I haven't done enough to keep his love. And what I realized is that, you know, as I came to understand how God views love and truth in this, is that those were deceits. And Satan, like, really hits us in this world with feelings. Like, feelings are everything. Follow your heart, you know. You're all that you, you know, it's just, it's crazy, but it's all about our feelings. All this positivity stuff. And I'm, I'm all, all for optimism, but I think we can go a little bit on the deep end of this positivity stuff because it focuses on feelings and not truth and not convictions and not God's word because God's word is greater than our feelings. It talks about that in, in uh, first John four, that God is greater than our feelings. He's greater than this conscious things that we feel inside of ourselves. And so we have to make sure that we're recognizing if our feelings are equaling truth and we use the scriptures to do that, we filter our feelings through the scriptures. That's a whole nother lesson. I think I've already done that one. So check back on the YouTube channel to, to see that one. But let's get back to the truth behind rejection and abandonment. Okay. So when our spouse says, you know, oh, I'm going to pursue, you know, porn that because I get more intimacy online than I do from you or, or, you know, they, they're pursuing another relationship. Maybe they're living with somebody else. Maybe you guys are already um, separated. Uh, and they are pursuing somebody else because that feel, they feel like that person's going to meet their need better than you will. Okay. So what they're really saying is that they're pursuing something because they are empty, because they have a hole inside of themselves. And we're going to look at this scripture in um, Isaiah 55. It says, why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Okay. So this was the prophet Isaiah talking about the nation of Israel and they were pursuing idols. Okay. They were running after things that were never going to fill them up and see, we haven't changed in 5,000 years. Okay. We still run after things, you know, inside of ourselves. We still run after things that don't satisfy us. The world presents all kinds of things, entertainment, social media, food, relationships, even children. Okay. We go to these things to fill us up. Okay. These are created things that God did not design to give us value, to give us identity. Okay. So we look to these things and our spouse, because they are, um, they listen to the world, you know, they listen to their feelings and their feelings and the world are telling them what you really need to fill yourself up is a relationship. What you really need to feel like a man is many women. Okay. So they go and they listen to this stuff, but you know what? They never get satisfied. They may be with one other person right now, but you know what? If they couldn't make it with you, they're not going to make it with them. No matter how much they try to convince themselves, both of those people, okay, in an immoral relationship, in an adulterous relationship, are never going to be satisfied. They're actually using each other because they feel empty. All right. So, and even with porn, okay, men or women who watch porn are going to this to satisfy a need okay, to sat, to fill themselves up with something that will never satisfy. That's why they keep having to go work more and more and more into more and more uh, depths of sin in order to, to cover up. Uh, and really what's happening is in their brain, they're filling up their mind. They're, they're uh, releasing a chemical in the brain called dopamine. Every time they get this high, they keep wanting more and more, but like everything else our body does, it adapts. 
So we have to be, keep doing more and more. So they're pursuing these things, but they never really satisfy. And so they may be jumping from relationship to relationship or, or they may have a ton of porn stored up on their computer, but none of it really satisfies them because it wasn't designed to. Okay, the world leaves us empty. All right. So another thing to remember when your spouse rejects you, okay, he's really not rejecting you. Okay. He's rejecting somebody else. We're going to look, it's a little bit of a lengthy scripture, but I really want to look at this because I think it makes a really good point. So this was the nation of Israel and Samuel and the nation of Israel. God had basically been their king for a while, but they got, they started to see what was going on around them. And they basically asked Samuel, they said, appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. But they said, um, but when they said this, uh, that they wanted a king to lead them, this displeased Samuel. He was their prophet. You know, he knew what they really needed. He was the one who was supposed to keep them close to God. Um, so he prayed to the Lord and the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected. Okay. But they have rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods that they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim, will do to claim. So see, Samuel was like really concerned. Why is this going on? But when it came down to it, they weren't rejecting what Samuel was teaching them. He was like, don't do this. They were rejecting God. Okay. And then, you know, Samuel goes on and he explains, you know, you don't really realize what you're asking me that, you know, if you want a king, okay, this is what he's going to do. He's going to basically enslave you. He's going to take all of your property. He's going to take your children for soldiering and he's going to do all these things. And then it says in um, verse uh, 19 through 21 of that same chapter, he says, but the people refuse to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we will be like all the other nations with the king to lead us and to go out before us and fight our battles. When Samuel heard all that the people said, he repeated it before the Lord. The Lord answered, listen to them and give them a king. Now, why would God do that? Why would God say, just give them a king? Well, we have our answer in Romans 1. If you look at Romans 1 verses 18 through about 32, it talks about how God has given us everything we need in this world to really know that he is there. Like the evidence is there, but men get ungrateful. And I'm not talking just men, I'm talking women. We get ungrateful and we choose to follow other things, created things rather than following God. And it says that God gives us over to that. He's not going to like stand in our way and go, no, don't, st don't do this. You know, stop. He's already given us the scriptures to tell us that. He beg, begs us on numerous occasions, you know, choose what you're going to do. This is the consequences if you make that choice, okay? Or our spouse is not rejecting us the way the Israelites rejected Samuel. Our spouse is rejecting God. And I think it's really important that we see this. This is, this is seeing things through spiritual eyes. This is seeing our marriage and our relationship with um, our spouse through spiritual eyes, okay? Really, and this may sound a little callous, but I want you to see that you are simply collateral damage in your bro in your husband's broken relationship with God, that your children are collateral damage and our spouse doesn't see that. Okay. They don't see what they're doing and the damage they're doing, but it's because they have a broken relationship with God. The only way that they're going to really learn intimacy and how to give and lay down their lives the way uh, Jesus did, the way he calls husbands to, especially in Ephesians 5 is by being connected to God, having an intimate relationship with God. So as daughters, we have to really start seeing our husbands, not as our husbands, but as men of God or broken men of God who don't have a relationship. So our, our marriage has to be secondary compared to our husband's salvation, okay? And I know this may be really out of the box for you in your thinking, but I had to get to that point in my marriage where I really recognize that my husband is my brother in Christ first and, and my husband second. And, and that was the order when, before we even got married, you know, I was a daughter of God first. And then when we go to heaven, you know, when Jesus comes or, or we die, that there's no marriage in heaven. The scriptures talk about that. So 
this t- period of time on earth is the only time that we have a relationship with our spouses. And so it's not really going to matter whether we're married in heaven because the relationships aren't going to exist in that way. We'll still be able to be close. But we have to start thinking long term, you know, my salvation, my husband. So I, I need to be more concerned about where my husband's going to spend eternity, not where he's going to spend this life. And, and that's what I had to get to a point to in my own marriage is really recognizing I needed to be more concerned about whether my husband was going to go to heaven or hell. And as long as I continue to run after the relationship and see him from a worldly perspective, then I was not really letting God work on him. I could only focus on me and myself and where God wanted me to be. And so we really have to change the way we view our spouses. And it talks about this in uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 16. It says, so from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. No one. That, and they, you know, Paul is referring more and more to um, the people that they were reaching out to, to share their faith with. But if our spouse has, has broken the relationship with God, then they're lost and they're counted in that no one. You know, We have to start viewing everybody around us through spiritual eyes and especially our spouse, especially we cannot view them through uh, worldly lenses, through the worldly view. And he, he talks about this even more in Colossians chapter three. He says, since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. So I'm really calling you to change the way you think. It goes against the tide. It goes against um, you know, the stream of life, everybody's focused on relationship, 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 but they're focused on physical relationships and they're not focused on their relationship with God and our spouse's relationship with God. Not that we're responsible for our spouse's salvation. We're not. But what we have to do is we have to really see our marriage through spiritual eyes and not the eyes of the world. Now, most likely your spouse doesn't know that um, the thing that they're pursuing, this these these sexual you know relationships or whatever, or this 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 porn feeling that you know they get from porn or whatever, that this is not intimacy. Okay, intimacy, and I've shared this before on some of the previous videos. Intimacy really is into me see. Okay, so being able to connect with somebody on an emotional and a spiritual level. That is what real intimacy is. And sex is the culmination of that. It is the, the product of that kind of intimacy. The kind of sexual relationship that God designed us to have is a product of really connecting with somebody because both of you are close to God, you know, and you're moving toward God. And as you move toward God, you get closer to each other. That's the way God designed real intimacy to be. So it's hard to have intimacy like that with people when we really don't understand what that intimacy looks like with God. All right. The other thing uh, to really understand the truth behind us is that uh, most of the time our spouses reject us, okay, or abandon us because they have core wounds. All right. So these core wounds prompt them to go to sex or alcohol or drugs or whatever, okay, because they have these core wounds and they're trying to medicate pain. So uh, I want to show you just some statistics, okay? So 72% of sexual addicts have been sexually abused themselves, okay? 72%, all right? 82% have been physically abused in some way, okay? And then a whopping 97% have been emotionally abused. Now, what do I mean by emotionally abused? Now, that doesn't mean, you know, that um, they're screamed out all the time. It could be, okay? Um, but it could be like what I went through that my father didn't know how to meet my emotional needs. He didn't know how to teach me how to work through conflict or to communicate with me on a deeper level. And so I was in a sense essentially abandoned by my father emotionally. And my mother has a lot of codependency issues. And so she didn't know how to meet a lot of those needs in me. So um, that's what I'm talking about by emotional abuse. Sometimes it's not even abuse as much as it's neglect. And our parents were neglected. So they couldn't pass on. They can't pass on what they don't know. So they couldn't pass it on to us. And so we've grown up. And now it's time for us to break those cycles. Well, I think it's important to recognize that your spouse 
may have gone through this. And so therefore, this is one of the reasons he is re- trying or the way you interpret it, he is rejecting you, but it's because he doesn't even know what he needs. He has no way of meeting those needs inside of himself. So uh, a man who really loves God will imitate the heart of Christ, as it talks about in Ephesians 5, to lay down their life for their spouse. So uh, the way that Jesus laid down himself for the church. So it's the complete opposite of what you are experiencing right now. That's the way God designed it. Now, what ends up happening is we we can uh, compromise God's standard because we don't know it well enough. We may not be reading the scriptures the way that we need to, to really see how does God feel about this? What does God think about this? And so we compromise our convictions uh, because we're not God's. And so I really want to encourage you again, you know, really go into the scriptures. And that's what we're going to do right now. We're going to really look at what the scriptures teach about God's relationship with us. And the fact that that God will never reject us. He will never abandon us. Now, we may walk away from him, but he will never walk away from us. So we're just going to go through a series of scriptures. I just want this to be a time of encouragement for you to really see how God feels about us. We're going to start in Deuteronomy 31, 8 says, the Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Okay. In Isaiah 52, 12, it says, you shall not leave in haste running for your lives. Uh, He's talking about when the people were um, escaping from the enemies who were chasing them down. He says, for the Lord will go ahead of you and he, the God of Israel, will protect you from behind. So he is ahead of you and he is also behind you. Okay. In Isaiah, uh, I'm sorry, let's go to the next one. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. This is when Jesus was getting ready to go to heaven. They felt like he was going to leave them. And so we had to encourage them to remind them what their mission was and the fact that he was going to be with them. And he said, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. All right. In Psalm 139, 1 through 5, it says, you have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, Lord, you know it completely. I love this part. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. I love that idea of God being both in front and behind me, that he's so close. It's like he's hemming me in. He's creating the safe boundary around me. And then uh, in Isaiah 55, 1 through 2, and we read a little bit about this part uh, earlier, but I think it really applies to us, that we really remember what we are running after. And he says, come all you who are thirsty, come to the waters and you who have no money, come buy and eat, come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and you will delight in the richest of fare. I love that passage because for me, I realized that all this energy I was expending on pursuing my unrepentant spouse, I was pursuing for my spouse to fill me up and it couldn't come from my husband. The only way that we can really find true value and, and true peace and true security is in our relationship with God. Our relationship with our spouse is a bonus in this world. But what we really need for our affirmation, for the blessings, for all the things that God designed only for him to meet, we have to go to him. We can't go to a created thing, which is our spouse or to, you know, social media or um, things. We can't, we can't go. They will not meet our deepest core needs. In fact, God says of himself that he is our great reward. So last scripture I want to look at is in, um, Genesis 15, 1. I love this. This is when Abraham, God was getting ready to talk about his promises or he had already shared about his promises. And it says, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. He says, do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield, your very great reward. And I know sometimes we can think, 
that that God's supposed to reward us because we're faithful to Him. You know, we we have these this expectation that God's going to bless us, you know, because we are faithful. But God says that those things that you're looking to the reward, you're not looking to the rewarder. I'm the I am the reward. And I know for me personally, I had to really recognize that I was looking to other things, especially to my spouse, to be my reward from God. And yet God himself is my great reward. God is the one who fulfills all the needs that I have ever needed and will ever need spiritually, emotionally, mentally, physically. God meets all those needs. My spouse is simply meant to be a companion that walks along beside me as he goes and looks to God as well. So these feelings of rejection and abandonment, I really want you to give them over to God. And remember that your spouse isn't rejecting you. If he chooses to leave your relationship, he's not abandoning you. He has abandoned God already. And that's, God is going to work on them, okay? Whether you're, whether it's your, your husband who has left you, if you're a man and your wife has left you, uh, that God is there for you. He will always be there for you. He longs to be close to you. And he is going to work in your spouse's life. Now, you don't know if they're going to change. You, know, you don't know if they're going to claim the promises that God has for them. God's never going to force himself on them. They have to want it more than they want their sin. They have to be so sick of their sin that it doesn't satisfy that they turn to God. But meanwhile, you have to work on yourself. That's what I chose to do. So we have to make sure that... Um, who comes first in our heart is our relationship with God. Who gives us value? Who affirms us? Who gives us peace and security? But that's got to come from a deep and intimate relationship with God. Okay. So if you are tired of running the rat race with your spouse, you, what I call the insanity loop, doing the same thing over and over, expecting different results, your spouse is unrepentant, or maybe they are in recovery, but you're stuck where you are then I want to encourage you to give me a call, okay? I do these free breakthrough calls. We get on the phone for about 45 minutes to an hour, and we talk through your individual situation. But I only want you to call if you are really prepared to let the Bible be your standard, that the, the, the scriptures are very clear how we can really get healthy through this kind of stuff. Um, you can also have an experience guide, me, and um, and we will walk you through this process, okay? But but you have to be desperate for it. You can't be ready to make excuses or all the you know all the things that have kept you where you are. You have to have reached the end of your rope. You know, reach that that threshold of your pain that you're really really ready to change. Because we will look at the truth. We really will look at the truth about where you are, and we'll talk about where your spouse is. But the focus is for you to get well, for you to get healthy. So if you're ready to do that, I'm going to put the link up here. And I want you to encourage you to schedule a call. It is hopeforspouses.com slash call. Again, that's hopeforspouses.com slash call. We'll get on the phone for a little bit, talk through it, and see if we are a, a, a good fit. But before you get off the phone, I promise you're going to get clarity. You're going to get some good direction. And I will give you some great resources. So if, um, if you're there. Let's do that. All right. So I will see you next week on the Hope for Spouses Lunchtime Live. Have a good one.